Hi, Audrey. So I can hear you fine. Can you hear me? Uh, I can hear you fine. Okay, Absolutely. Okay. Um, one quick thing before we start, mm -hmm. um, and it's it's fine either way. Uh, are you all right with me uh, recording this? Um, it won't be for public. It will just be for our records as we're writing the book. Are you okay um, with me recording this and publishing this on YouTube? Yeah, if you would like to. Okay, so let's both record so that we have at least two copies. Uh, and Excellent. and I'll release to YouTube uh, at the end of the talk if you don't have any part that you want to um, modify. Excellent, excellent. Okay, so let me let me start this. Uh, actually, I apologize. I practiced with this yesterday. I usually use my Skype for at work, mm -hmm. not my personal one, which has. Uh, so I'm not used to using this one. Um, unfortunately, I'm not sure if it's letting me record. Okay. Well, I'm recording, so... Uh, okay. Yeah. Why, don't we, why don't we just go with your record? Is that all right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure, of course. Excellent. So, thank you so much for agreeing to the interview. Uh, it's a real honor, and as I mentioned in our original message, I mean, I think for a variety of reasons, we've been very inspired by the work you've been doing, and we're trying to find out a little bit more about it, uh, particularly for our project that we're working on in terms of our book, Guerrilla Democracy, but also in terms of broader issues about how we can use technology as a kind of disruptive and positive political force. Um, so I guess if it's all right, and I know you've probably done this many, many times, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes. if you want to take a couple of minutes just to give a little bit of your background and how you kind of move from the point of view of kind of coding and free software into, mm -hmm. or into the, a more political mm -hmm. uh, domain. Sure. Uh, my background is pretty transparent. Um, I started coding uh, when I was eight years old. That was 1989. Uh, and I moved uh, to um, basically start my own uh, web-based uh, startup uh, with a bunch of friends when I was 14 years old. That was 1995, and the web was just starting. Um, and I dropped out of junior high school uh, because of um, all the research uh, that I can do on the World Web is now free, and all the researchers just roll back to me instantly. I don't have to go through the um, you know letters anymore. Um, and the <laughs> principal uh, actually supported me, and, and which is very rare, and then that instilled me uh, a um, a lot of hope in the flexibility of bureaucracy. Um, and because of um, the fact that most of the World Web at the time. Um, is uh, things like archive.org and things like um, you know the IETF, the World Foundation, and so on. It's very cutting edge. People put their uh, cutting edge research on it, and I also work with the uh, early, like the Gutenberg project, and so on, which dis digitized a lot of early uh, commons. Um, that is to say, does uh, works that have fallen out of copyright, uh, which we are just getting a new batch uh, as, as of this year. Uh, and but by the time uh, that I'm a um, dropped out of junior high, um, the Gutenberg project is mostly uh, work that has been written before the First World War. Uh, that is to say, mm -hmm. the, the classics, uh, which again instilled in me uh, a reasonable optimism because I don't have access to any depressing works. Um, and so that's my my self self educated the background, uh, more or less. And then I worked in the free software movement, which then rebranded mm -hmm. part of ourselves into the open source movement. Um, and to me, it's always political. Um, there is uh, no um, coercion, of course, across the internet. You can't uh, beat someone or coercively take away their possessions. But nevertheless, it is politics. It is how to figure out rough consensus. It is how to set a standard setting agenda. It is uh, how to moderate between the various different interests that want to take the internet on various directions and so on. And so that is the kind of uh, politic that I'm most familiar with, the IETF style uh, politics, yeah. uh, that is anarchism really, uh, yeah. which I'm <laughs> versed in, uh, in maybe for five years before I get my first voting right uh, in representative democracy, uh, which would be in 19... Um, Actually, no, it will be in 
2001. Um, so for me, I think participative democracy over the internet is my kind of native tribe, uh, and representative democracy is kind of a new thing to me. Um, but that is not just to me alone, because in Taiwan we only got the first presidential election in 1996, uh, but that's already almost a decade after lifting of the martial law. So I, I, I'm not that unique in the sense that uh, people mostly experimented with a lot of community level or internet level um, consensus making before we actually get to elect for our own president uh, about 30 years ago. Uh, and so in Taiwan, representative democracy is kind of a new overlay, but people take a lot of uh, consensus-based um, uh, participative um, decision-making processes uh, that they are already very versed in and just overlay on top of it representative democracy. So, which is why I think uh, many people, what we call the civic hackers in Taiwan, are at once uh, technologists, but also uh, people working on democracy because in Taiwan there's no 200 years of democratic or republican or federal tradition. For, mm. for us it's all the very same generation that gets to experiment with all these things. And so I think I formally uh, began working in politics um, at the end of 2014 uh, as an advisor to the uh, cabinet uh, at that time because of, of the sunflower um, Occupy. Uh, many people saw that over the course of three weeks, it's possible to use internet to mediate um, half a million people on the street and many more online, so that people gradually converge on consensus without the need of using uh, traditional representative uh, mechanisms, uh, and which uh, kind of were on strike anyway because the MPs were refusing to deliberate the service and trade agreement. So people occupy the parliament and uh, doing without the overlaid. Um, representative um, democracy, but actually going back to the communal participative democracy, and it actually worked and delivered a pretty good set of consensus. And so um, many ministries uh, at the end of that year really wanted to learn how to uh, harness this kind of potential uh, as offered by internet-based participation. And so we built quite a few systems together, uh, and I was kind of a understudy minister, uh, kind of a reverse mentor uh, to the uh, minister, Jack Lin Tsai, the minister with a portfolio in charge of cyberspace law. Um, and so that continued for a couple of years, and then I became the digital minister, kind of no longer understudy, uh, but still running pretty much exactly the same thing as I started uh, participating at the end of 2014. So that's like the six-minute version. <laughs> no, that, that's perfect. I think that's a, a really kind of nice background and foundation, and I, and I think it opens up a lot of uh, kind of really interesting ways in which we can kind of explore this a bit further, uh, theoretically and politically. So I think one of the first things that I was really interested in that you were saying, and that some of the work that you're doing is the fact that you come from a tradition, and I, and I like how you said you kind of native tribe, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. is this kind of free software movement, and also some of the anarchism that's part of it that isn't actually nationally based. And in fact, I think a lot of the kind of hacker, original hacker politics was almost an alternative form of globalization, which is saying, you know, we don't have to respect your kind of non-digital borders because we have different forms of community. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to explore a little bit about, if it's all right, sure. how you see this creating kind of transnational democratic communities. And then we can talk about a little bit about how that relates to kind of more local political struggles and how they're related to each other. Certainly. So uh, my first experience with democratic processes uh, includes, for example, the Debian Constitution. Uh, and the Debian mm -hmm. Constitution explicitly says, you know, nobody forces anyone to do anything as a volunteer community. But as soon as you agree to play by the Debian rules, it is actually very intricate relationship between proposals, between running for leaders, between a Condorcet mm -hmm. voting system, a uh, very complex tie-breaking system, uh, a lot of checks and balances, uh, which is why it's called a constitution. Um, so uh, it means that uh, the process itself uh, is in the commons, right? Everybody can amend the yeah. Debian constitution. Certainly easier than amending the Taiwan's constitution. <laughs> and, and it <laughs> keeps the constitution alive in the sense that it's this relevant to everybody who participates uh, in, in the Debian community. And, and so 
even if no Debian developer would dedicate 100% of their time on the democratic process, I would say that on average, they're much more aware of a democratic process uh, that is powering the community than yeah. an average citizen in any democratic community. Uh, and so I think that's the first uh, difference, I would say, of this, um, this transnational uh, idea. And the second thing is that um, we see a lot of uh, democracy bookkeeping um, as something that could be automated. It. Anything that doesn't um, interfere uh, with the judgment process, that doesn't require a value judgment, basically, uh, could potentially be automated. So a lot of voting systems and a lot of opinion systems, a lot of uh, you know, ahead notice, notification, things like that. People experimented with a lot of uh, bots or uh, discussion boards or a lot of system that uh, lets people take care of more than say, 100 issues without completely getting lost, right? So there's yeah. also a lot of early experiments on the Slash community, on the Corrosion community, on many other communities uh, that uh, intentionally experiments about what I would call attention management um, issues. Then again, uh, once you can take care of many dialogue at once, it opens the possibility of looking at one common issue from many different angles. That is to say, to take mm -hmm. All the sides, or even if not all the sides, more sides than one side, <laughs> which is what you get <laughs> if you don't have sufficient bandwidth. Like if you only have yeah. three bits uh, of upload per four years, which is a vote basically, yeah. <laughs> then it kind of forces people to to only take one side. Yeah. But if you do attention management with good uh, symmetrical bandwidth, then of course it enables mm. people to listen to one another much easier, um, and with what I call a, a scalable listening apparatus. So uh, I think it's mm. two things. It's one of the the background awareness of a um, malleable, uh, relevant <clears throat> constitutional system. And the second is that uh, the system itself using automated uh, tools also lets people manage their attention much more efficiently. And so they can take more size than one. Mm. Excellent. I mean, one of the things that you we've seen in a lot of these movements that have used, um, before going to the more governance part mm -hmm. of uh, quote unquote e-democracy, mm -hmm is actually, you know, the ability to use mobile technologies in the broadest sense of the term mm -hmm. to mobilize support and mm -hmm. to actually mobilize support across a large group of people mm -hmm. and focus it. But one of the aspects that we're looking at is how much actually of a civic hacker mentality is actually informing this and how much is this just a tool. So, mm -hmm. for example, a lot of the work that you've done, if I can be so bold, mm -hmm. is trying to bring in ideas of like open source collaborative problem solving. Mm -hmm. That's right. So more than voting or more than just reading about issues. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about what you think are some of the kind of civic hacker and even anarchist values that can inform this. Mm -hmm. And also, what are some of the obstacles to actually getting people to think in this more expansive democratic way? Mm -hmm. Right. So um, I think the, the foremost uh, the difference is that in the agenda setting stage, that is to say, long mm -hmm. before voting anything, uh, one needs okay. to uh, agree that there is something wrong with the current social, environmental, or economic situation, uh, and or that there is some potential to change, right? And that is kind of mm -hmm. the, the initial call to action. Um, so um, it's interesting that you, you mentioned mobile technology, because uh, to me, um, mobile, especially in terms of mobile phones, um, to me, its its main factor is that it's mm -hmm. operating on a... Um, a slice of attention, uh, meaning the screen is smaller, uh, the engagement is shorter, uh, and that it mostly motivates uh, by people's outrage or other uh, viral yes. emotions uh, rather than a um, like dedicated time to think uh, about, to mm -hmm. deliberate about any certain things. And so usually uh, when we utilize um, mobile technologies, we make sure that we use it only in the very front of the, the stage. That is to say, we make sure that it is to raise the awareness that something is wrong yeah. or that something needs talking about. But we actually don't use mobile technologies to, to replace the face-to-face -face talking about or to this kind of one-on-one -on -one Skype session yeah. uh, that uh, we explicitly you know, use a desktop um, form factor <laughs> to, to make yeah. sure that we're, we're <laughs> talking uh, at each other in with better yes. attunement uh, than those uh, slice of, of conversations. So I would distinguish between two uh, polar, not really polar, but connected sides. One is to, yep. to the outrage part, 
and the sec and the second is the deliberation part. Uh, and I think um, it, it's I think there's a there's a psychological phenomenon called the empathy gap, meaning that if one is outraged, it's very hard to empathize a calm person, yeah. and vice versa. And and if you're very calm, it's very hard to to empathize with a outraged person. Uh, and so it, it I, I think there's both of these in all of us. So what's important yeah. is that yeah. we design the engagement principles so that we don't confuse or, or mix those two modalities too much together. Mm -hmm. We use the outrage part uh, to spread a message and to invite people who are outraged two weeks mm -hmm. after this initial call for, for um, uh, you know, complaints uh, into a physical space and with good, uh, safe design and that people can still participate over the internet but always with a much more dedicated synchronous, uh, if not the same place, um, design. And so the asynchronous part, I think, is important but it cannot uh, replace the synchronous part. Absolutely. I mean, and I think that's a really interesting way because what we've been looking at a little bit as well is how mobile technologies can serve as, like you said, a very nice upfront ability to not just do the outrage part, but also form connections to, through things like WhatsApp and create solidarity, mm -hmm. but then the governance part. Mm -hmm. Even if it's something like creating a strike, mm -hmm. okay, so you use WhatsApp to organize a strike, then what comes next? Mm -hmm. How do you engage in collective bargaining? How do you engage in actually you know, a vibrant economic union, a co-op, or mm -hmm. in a more political sense? Mm -hmm. and, and I think... One of the things, though, that is really interesting is, though, as well, is in terms of 21st century solidarity. Mm -hmm. Now, traditionally, this would mean, you know, this is kind of almost Orwellian, like, I, I, you know, he went down to the Spanish Civil War, and he fought, and he got shot. That's right. It also means, like, mm -hmm. the kind of common turn. But one of the things that I found really interesting, and, and again, if I can be so bold, as I, I've uh, seen in some of your other interviews, is mm -hmm. that while you yourself work within Taiwan, mm -hmm. You seem, and others, you know, in the kind of civic hacking movement and also in the kind of more technological politics and certainly with the anarchism, see solidarity as more of a kind of sharing of knowledge and information mm -hmm. and learning best practices and things. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that in terms of you, we seem to have a lot of different kind of progressive technological movements coming, like from Momentum to in the UK to our revolution in the US. And how do you create solidarity in which you're actually speaking to each other, recognizing their local issues and that, you know, these are local struggles, but actually also sharing best practices and things mm -hmm. and creating a kind of, you know, digital solidarity? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I think there's quite a few things. Um, for example, when I first uh, encountered the phenomena of uh, free software, um, it's very interesting that people talk about all the fine details of free software license. There's lots of flame wars being fought about uh, the, the <laughs> nitty gritties of, of open source licensing. Uh, sorry, free software slash open source licensing. Uh, but there's uh, absolutely nobody putting into the license a limitation based on countries, right? Um, yeah. when, when we get in to this century with open data license and so on, uh, when it's being pushed by the government, we see sometimes mm -hmm. a, a restriction based on borders and so on. Uh, but people in the open knowledge, people working on open definition, were very quick to say you, you should not discriminate uh, between um, yep. people of different uh, countries or jurisdictions. And, and so I think um, it's very kind of taken for granted that anyone who participates in the digital commons is kind of in its own tribe uh, because once you agree to those self-ruling, uh, the Debian constitution that I alluded to, it's kind of a new jurisdiction. Uh, and the jurisdiction is not based on, of course, coercive uh, police power, but it is based on some kind of power that is uh, at once uh, a norm, which means the hacker ethics and everything, but also automated tools, which uh, delineates what's easy and what's not, what's, what's uh, done and what's not done. And so because of, I think, this jurisdiction uh, no view of the commons, it uh, kind of take partly from the scientific tradition in the sense that if you publish, uh, you donate your work into the commons, but it's yeah. recursive, meaning that you also let others work, um, kind of co-determining what, what you do next. Because, for example, mm -hmm. if I uh, make our discussions uh, on the, for example, the discourse system or on the media wiki system, 
any software update is going to shape actually how I talk about these things with my fellow citizens. So on the technique level, it doesn't have to uh, pass a, uh, a vote or anything like that. Just by improving the tools that we each other use is a kind of solidarity. And I'm keenly aware that as a digital minister of Taiwan, almost none of the tools that I'm using daily is from you know people who identify as Taiwanese. <laughs> the the, the <laughs> <laughs> right, the the sandstorm system that we use for collaborative editing, um, the yeah. uh, say it system that we use for transcript keeping, and basically they all came from like the uh, vocabulary that we use called Akoma Ntoso, which is uh, African, uh, and so on. They, the names itself kind of carry their local cultural traditions, and it also wow. reminds us uh, like Ubuntu, right? It reminds us there's different philosophies in in the world, and yes. just in the in the course of translating these concepts into everyday conversation or even to our local language like Mandarin or Taiwanese, Holog or whatever, uh, we, we are forced to uh, kind of uh, look back at the tradition that produced uh, these ideas and the traditions are automatically our kin because we are using their products in a uh, culture forming way. Uh, but not uh, explicitly with these people, but rather with their work that kind of uh, imbues, um, they imbue their philosophy into those works. And so I would argue yeah. it's, it's both ways. It's the norms that's created that, that creates a people-to-people uh, -people solidarity, but there's also people-to-object, yeah. and object shapes people, and people go and create more object, that more recursive kind of solidarity. And both are, of course, very important. No, and, and I think that's really interesting because that, that goes to a kind of uh, another issue that I want to speak about, um, which is the fact that I think sometimes when kind of the work that you're doing, but also the work that others are doing are spoken about is that it's not really the e-democracy, if I again, can be so bold, movement of the 90s, right? In that you're not simply trying to create tools, you're actually trying to show how you know, technology is not inevitable, if I can be the word, mm -hmm. um, a lot of the disruptive things. And I think the point you made about automation is really interesting mm -hmm. because most people view automation as something, a threat, mm -hmm. particularly to jobs. But you've actually shown how automation can be something very positive. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if we could talk a little bit about how this is ideological in a sense of being more than just tools, but also showing people that they can have democratic control over technologies and mm -hmm. its use. Right. So, uh, for example, when I see AI, I always pronounce it assistive intelligence. And I think it is, yes. a, it is an ideological choose of, choice of words because um, AI, unlike deep learning or whatever that has a fine scientific uh, definition, uh, AI is really anything that the humans choose not to do <laughs> and the machines <laughs> somehow <laughs> somehow does it right <laughs> it doesn't prescribe anything about it doesn't even have yeah. to be computer right <laughs> so, so um, yeah. it, it could be any assistive intelligence uh, it could be you know animal intelligence so in, in mm. what, what, what I mean is that if we look at in an assistive intelligence kind of view um, it's less threatening precisely because it uh, kind of says, just as in personal computer, when the first personal computers were being forged, um, you know, the IBM PC clones or prior to that Apple II or whatever, it kind of promised the, the idea of a, a maker or a tinkering spirit in a sense that mm -hmm. if you don't like uh, what your computer does, there's always an easy way for you to find some neighbor kid who, uh, you know, hack the computer <laughs> <laughs> until the computer does uh, things that uh, you personally find more gratifying. And, and that's what personal computing means. Prior to personal computing, it means a terminal, right? Which is just a screen and a keyboard or a, um, you know, a teletype and a keyboard. Uh, and that connects to a mainframe and have all the uh, programs being uh, determined or predetermined by the programmers uh, in the um, mainframe. But personal computing means, well, you can do anything and nobody uh, can stop you from installing a new uh, application on your personal computer because, hey, it's personal. Uh, and so so I think that's the same idea that we're taking uh, to uh, be it assistive intelligence or to shared reality, augmented reality and things like that in, in the sense that if we uh, start with a few axioms like 
broadband as human right, which is uh, a thing yeah. in Taiwan, and K to twelve education uh, of equal access to the computing resources and uh, basic literacy that includes uh, media literacy and digital literacy. If we start with these axioms, we are basically saying, you know, the the AI is co-determined by the social norm because we expect the local people to uh, tinker the self-driving tricycles or whatever, uh, including the norms and parameters and everything. Thing, uh, so that they are comfortable with it before releasing it uh, to the to the public. And but if yes. we don't have that, then it's mostly just a few people. Uh, and no matter <clears throat> how they design, uh, you know, privacy by default or whatever by default, it, it never works because it is not yeah. really a participatory design. The designer. Uh, would be arrogant, just as in mainframes, uh, and not humble, as in uh, personal computer. Excellent. No, and, and I think that's a really interesting thing about how you know we don't do this enough, recognizing the continuous political democratization within, uh, I think, digital and computerization in general. Mm -hmm. um, I want to talk a little bit about when we think about democracy and moving it beyond just traditional politics, and one of the interesting kind of things about your career, if I can be, or mm -hmm. careers may be a big mm -hmm. word, but trajectory is that, mm -hmm. like you said, I mean, representative democracy was not where you started. Mm -hmm. um, you definitely, I would say, did not have the kind of West Wing culture or mm -hmm. background. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, from an entirely different, mm -hmm. as you said, tribe mm -hmm. and political tradition things. Um, so I'm wondering, how do we begin to think about this as more than just, you know, helping governments or working within a traditional political frame and actually think about, well, we can democratize workplaces. Mm -hmm. We can democratize the gig economy, mm -hmm. these types of things. Because I think that has been a kind of a difficult link. And what you've then seen is the fact that, you know, the that workers have kind of taken it upon themselves. So you saw in the U.S., for instance, the use of Facebook for teacher strikes, mm -hmm. right? Um, and that was a little bit of a surprise, I think, to a lot of people working in this realm, particularly within even activist communities like Occupy, but then people working, you know, in good faith in the government, they kind of say, oh, well, you know, <laughs> industrial democracy is something we just hadn't really thought about. And actually, it's something very important. Um, so I'm wondering, you know, how we move beyond traditional realms of democracy to think about digital democratization more widely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think it's much easier if you start with the um, small scale uh, organizations. Think of a small community of maybe 50 people or a small co-op of maybe 30 people. Uh, I think these yes. are the places where uh, we see the most um, <clears throat> inventions of self-organization, mostly because if people already know each other, they trust each other more to introduce more, uh, you know, yeah. experimental digital apparatus, whereas if it's, it's 23 million people, uh, of course you take a referendum or something <laughs> to, to, to make a drastic change. Yeah, yeah. yeah so, so I think the for example, the, the Lumio folks uh, in New Zealand, they, they didn't mm -hmm. start from, from scratch, right? They, they started from Occupy Wellington, they started from a co-op culture called Inspiral, and so, and so their decision-making um, apparatus, the so-called uh, democratizing the workplace uh, product called Lumio, uh, it is almost entirely driven by the real demand of maybe 30 people or 50 people who really want to keep track of who's working on what um, together and uh, to do uh, like straw polls or conversations in a way that uh, really empowers uh, each individual person instead of some abstract ideal goal. And I think that's really the most um, um, creative uh, or substantially creative uh, thing that I can imagine because we we use a lot of tools in our um, civic tech uh, community. We actually re recycle through a lot of tools. As soon as new tools come up, we just uh, take new ones uh, into our ecosystem. But we can do that because we have a firm understanding of what each stakeholder in the co-op or in the social innovation lab or whatever, uh, what, what their real interests are and where the tools are there to speed up some uh, chores or whether it's there to capture uh, some moments uh, to make uh, like remote conversations possible, uh, to take a 
actual GovTech uh, example, starting this year, Taiwan is uh, doing a regional revitalization plan where we identified a hundred or so counties that have a, a shrinking uh, brain drain or whatever uh, aging uh, population, and we encourage people who work in the national government to relocate back to their hometown, basically, uh, mm -hmm. and telework. Uh, and and, yep. and with, with a, such a simple thing as telework, because I entered the cabinet with a teleworking uh, kind of working condition, right? With such a thing, simple thing as telework, we actually have to do a lot of service design to look at uh, the everyday work of uh, paper pushing in, in a, any work, workplace, government just yeah. being one, uh, and to make them uh, amenable to remote work. But once you do that, everything gets digitized automatically. And then so the, the analytics, the searching, the various network forming uh, becomes much easier uh, because back in the days of paper and telephone, uh, once there's an emergent issue, like uh, people who want to talk about um, digital democracy, I, I can't really pick up a phone and call each of my colleagues saying, hey, do you have anything to say about digital democracy? Yeah. Uh, if someone email everybody in their organization, government or not, saying, hey, do, do you have anything to say about digital democracy? They probably get fired <laughs> the, the next day. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but, yeah, but once you have reply optional uh, kind of work out loud uh, um, hubs um, for, for things like, um, you know, the, the activity stream, like uh, we use Rocket Chat, but it could be Slack, uh, then it's, it's yeah. actually very easy to just type out something that's reply optional. And people who, who then reply uh, automatically form a team and, and things like that. So it enables a, a workflow that uh, is only possible if people already get into the habit of working in the remote. But then that only becomes possible because people already have uh, some comfortable um, experiences working in the same room. And so for me, yeah. uh, a, a lot of that is grown out of the organic need of small scale mm -hmm. organizing uh, needs. And we don't start thinking about like 5 million people or anything like that. We just think yeah. about maybe 50 groups and each of maybe 50 people and how do we scale that? Mm. And I think that then is a really interesting point as well about what is the relationship between systematic change and the experimentation that is really implicit within any system mm -hmm. within these. So I know that there is a bit of a discussion about, you know, how anti-capitalist, for instance, mm -hmm. we should be and about, you know, are we, when we're looking at things like innovation hubs, which are very interesting, mm -hmm. um, are we though really, you know, uh, are we just working around the edges, so to speak? Mm -hmm. Well, others say, I think very much of this, you know, this has always been a bottom-up movement. You create mm -hmm. these kind of local technological communities, mm -hmm. and, you know, and I'm wondering for yourself, how do you balance those things between mm -hmm. having a clear kind of anti-status quo agenda that does want a different type of world with also recognizing that this has always been a local bottom-up movement. Yeah, well, I'm going to be a lot uh, biased because we had this debate when the term open source was coined. Uh, <laughs> right? the, the, the That's term, what I asked. Yeah, the term open source was coined because uh, a bunch of people, ESR and friends, uh, wanted to, to form a marketing campaign of a traditional human right-based narrative that is the free software movement. Uh, and yeah. <clears throat> basically, it's not selling human right, right? It is basically telling the capitalists that the way uh, you're, you're making um, you know, um, software using your capital is creating social and um, a, a challenge in solidarity, let's talk, talk about this way. Uh, and we can solve it not because uh, we want to do away with capitalism, but actually you can shift the capital first from uh, a entirely harm causing capital into capital that avoids harm, right? Like at least yeah. being, being honest of uh, uh, what kind of software stack you're using. And then uh, generally turning it into so-called benefit stakeholder or stakeholder benefiting capital, meaning that if there's things that you don't want to maintain yourself, you just use the open source license and the community shares the maintenance cost. And finally, you can have capital that contribute to solutions. For example, the Mozilla Corporation being the flagship example. And so um, I think there's capital and there's capital. And if you do the marketing and communication right, you can shift the color of the capital itself uh, into um, at least benefit uh, capital that is 
good for both bottom lines or triple bottom lines, as we call it nowadays. But if you uh, really do the um, value alignment right, uh, like for example during the Mozilla Corporation's uh, rebranding and how they did the Firefox, um, you know, mar market communication, you can say, okay, so so we earn a lot of money, but a hundred percent of which is going back to the open source community, and and yeah. I think that creates a lot of. Uh, interest in people using those uh, grants or whatever research money that Mozilla is putting uh, putting forth uh, into really fundamental infrastructure work like let's encrypt like the Rust language and things like that things that traditionally would not get funded by the private sector but it's now nevertheless being funded by the private sector yeah. and so and, and so I think if you have a strategy that begins with scaling impact but without yeah. being too discriminating of what kind of early stage solutions that you're you're looking at, basically you're saying any early stage solution that shows promise, I'm I'm happy to yeah. scale it up, uh, and then it gives people who are traditionally trained in capitalist regimes something more meaningful to do with their lives or something like that. No, I think that's a really interesting point because that takes then to I have just a couple more questions if that's all right. And, sure, of course. Um, which is you know. We mention a lot of the fact that there's a lot of different types of communities from, I would say, things that are happening like in Barcelona and parts of Europe, which is very much like, you know, these kind of urban labs. Then you have within, I would say, business schools, um, sometimes innovation hubs, which are much more about, you know, market based solutions. Um, and then you have kind of, you know, really strong, often subversive specific hacker organizations that you sort of know and sort of don't know. Mm -hmm. um, and then, like you said, that you have a lot of gov tech and civ tech types of organizations. And I'm wondering, you know, how do you actually begin processes of bringing those together in kinds of open dialogues and discussions and also saying that, you know, we're not trying to tell you how to, what your culture should be, but we do want to actually create, you know, mobile spaces for sharing information and changing, like you said, culture so that we can scale up good ideas that you find beyond just, you know, your own place that you're working in. Mm -hmm. Well, you start with the open source license. <laughs> well, uh, well, that's that's without goes without saying. But uh, really, without a good license management uh, apparatus, we're <laughs> we're back to square one, where uh, people only work with people who they already know, right? Uh, it is yeah. the, the the fact that you can go to a Microsoft website called GitHub uh, and <laughs> look at whatever um, creations that fits uh, maybe solves fifty percent of whatever problem you're working on and starting building an ad hoc community based on these offerings that creates a kind of an easy solidarity with anyone who, who puts forward their half-finished work uh, and for people's critique. Uh, I'm not pretending mm -hmm. that it's, it's, it's uh, completely um, open or it's completely fine, but, but it, be, it begins a point of conversation around which, uh, just mm -hmm. as I like to quote Leona Cohen, uh, right, is the crack like where, where <laughs> the light gets in, right? Without this mismatch between cultures, between offerings and needs, between uh, people's expectations and the actual deliverings, um, there's no chance of uh, starting a conversation because there's no object that could be a social object. It could be uh, just, you know, internal objects that people don't get to form a social relationship. And so that's always the first step. And now once you have those social objects, I would argue that uh, a, a regular um, safe space that people can return to uh, is really the second thing. Uh, we have in various different communities, like um, for example, for, for the World Economic Forum, there's a uh, synchronously done World Social Forum, uh, or, yeah. uh, or yeah. uh, in all those um, civic tech uh, communities, there's tech tech and, and friends, but in the golf tech community, we have the Open Government Partnership and friends. And, and so it, I think it, it is a something predictable that you can always say, okay, one year ago or uh, a quarter ago, it, it's not, not quite good. We had a fight, we, our technologies don't match, our ideologies don't match and whatever, but you can always return a quarter later uh, into this quarterly uh, gathering and say, oh, but by the way, there's some new developments and things have changed. Yeah. Uh, and, and, but without this 
regular. It could be every quarter, every year, or in, a, in the case of the Vita One project, it's every week, every Wednesday. Um, without this kind of place where you can return to, there is no public of that you can recurse, right? So, but mm. to be a recursive public is to be a bunch of people that cares about how these people relate, not just one-shot transactional stakes, but rather how we hold the stakes and how we collectively hold these stakes. So I would argue that a safe space, both temporal and spatial, if possible, uh, is the, the next step uh, beyond the open license and the open um, mm. invitation for people to have a conversation. Absolutely. And I, and I think that like that kind of goes then to my last question, if it's all right, because I, I think you're mm -hmm. absolutely right. And, you know, one of the projects that we're doing, uh, well, we'd like to do on the back of this book is create kind of like a global consortium that mm -hmm. does create these kinds of temporal and spatial safe places. Um, but one of the aspects about this is, if I again can be a bit mm -hmm. provocative. Sure, of course. <laughs> it, yeah, um, it's the fact that Sometimes I see a bit of a disjuncture between the narratives that emerge around these, particularly around people like yourself, and what is actually being said. So when I see articles, if I, again, think things about, you know, oh, Audrey Tang, you know, just kind of genius coder who's mm -hmm. now been able to do this. And then what you actually say is, well, anyone can do this. That's right. <laughs> like, That's right. Yeah. Like, do it yourself. Um, and also, you know, some of the things that have kind of, you know, oh, well, this kind of almost... Steve Jobs kind of or, you know, Bill Gates, like, you know, she dropped out of school because she was so smart. And it's like, no, I dropped out of school because I thought the, you know, the information was already there and That's anyone right. can do this. And so I'm wondering, you know, this really brings to the forefront a really serious question about the fact that I think governments across the ideological spectrum are realizing that we need to redo education, particularly among young people, particularly even reeducating some older people. Um, around coding and these types of things to make them a more accessible language and use. But I think one of the real questions is what kinds of civic education do we need to really be doing in this digital civic education? Ones that allow us to go beyond what, if I can again be so bold, what I think is a very liberal capitalist notion of this kind of individual genius, mm -hmm. which is precisely, again, what I think you and others um, and your movement are trying to <laughs> do away with, you know, so how do we create that kind of narrative that this is a do it yourself, anyone can do this, this is dem democratic in its most pure sense, and then educational ways of thinking and agendas that actually say, you know, we have to combine, you know, digital education with civic education mm -hmm. from a very young age. Right. Um, so first of all, I would like to address the, the genius thing. Um, yeah. my, my first experience uh, reading the Cathedral and the Bazaar, which is a ESR thing, uh, um, is basically, a, I remember the quote um, that I think is in the chapter of in, the importance of having users. And there's really mm -hmm. no users. There's only co-developers. Uh, and <laughs> uh, and Lin, Linus Torvalds were quoted in that chapter. Uh, it's not the exact quote. I think uh, he says something like, I'm basically a very lazy person who happens to get a credit for things other people who want to do. Right? So, um, so that, but that's, that's the structure, right, <laughs> of the Linux <laughs> development, right? People ascribe yeah. everything to, to Linux and Linux, you know, knows, Linux knows something about this dynamic and he's being uh, lazy intentionally uh, by saying, you know, if you really want something, do, do that yourself and now maybe get it merged or something. Uh, yeah. And so I, I think um, this philosophy of uh, not the taking credit part, the, the creating possibilities part, I think is, is most important. If, if Linux is very um, strict in the milestone Stones or in the uh, nitty gritty details. That is, the, if he micromanage, uh, then yeah. I, I don't think the community will grow uh, as we see today uh, to the Linux community. So always, um, I think being humble in one's design is the, the most important thing. Uh, and if if that is um, something that could be learned, I think it could be learned only in a safe space where people share their aspirations, where they are not afraid to fail, where every anything learned, good or bad is uh, treasured as a community asset and, and things like that. And, and I, I can say now something about Linus' uh, home country and their culture, <laughs> but I think that would be going a bit too far. But, but I do think that it really 
really creates a, a different kind of uh, non-individualistic, certainly not American hero, uh, kind of uh, personality that is really required to start a very large project and still manage to make it work somehow. All the leaders yeah. that I work with in the programming language community, um, it could be Mats from the Ruby community, Larry from the Perl community, they all have the same kind of humbleness um, in them. Uh, I think that is the, the most important thing. So I really don't think this uh, heroic uh, narrative is helpful in the least, but uh, some yeah. you know journalists want to write it that way, and I cannot edit my own Wikipedia article, and so say la vie. <laughs> uh, so that's, that's the first part. And, 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 and the second part is um, how to make it the civic uh, uh, education. I, th I think that um, when I did the Pro 6 uh, work together with the Pro community, uh, we had a rallying cry called Optimize for Fun, or Dash Big O Fun uh, for short. And, and that basically means we, we optimize um, the subjective experience of a so-called user becoming a so-called co-developer. Uh, uh, and, yeah. Yeah, and, and I think this is, we, we can use any number of of uh, you know social hacks uh, to to do so. It could be good food. It could be music. It could be shibboleth. It could be <laughs> shared <laughs> memes, right? It could be uh, a bot that automatically hugs someone when someone gets a yeah. plus plus or, or whatever. It's really anything goes, but with the same end goal of turning the uh, act mm -hmm. of contribution into a very interesting one, uh, a fun uh, experience. And once people um, get the uh, intrinsic motivation. I, I don't think we need to ex uh, externally impose the so-called civic or civilized or whatever uh, a regime that disciplines people being good citizen because then they find um, joy in uh, making other people's experience better as they have been um, you know, shown uh, before. Mm -hmm. And so uh, a lot of techniques that I share, like hugging the trolls and things like that, all, all builds on the same <laughs> premise. That is basically yeah. to, to make the new newcomers or people who are contemplating a real contribution, um, a experience, a really positive experience to the same degree as I myself was welcome into the community in, in the first mm -hmm. place. So there's actually a lot of Ubuntu or a lot of indigenous culture is, is predicated on that before the, yeah. the transactional uh, industrial revolution view. And I think some some part of it is still very much alive uh, in the soft, free software and open communities in the sense that if they don't treasure their newcomers, they really don't get very far. So uh, all the large communities nowadays, Wikipedia, OpenStreetMap, and so on, all nurtures their newcomers this way in a sort of civic education, but never a indoctrinating education, but rather a co-developing experience. And it's yeah. also Darwinian, because if they don't do that, they don't exist after a couple of years. So all the, yeah. all the large... <laughs> <laughs> communities we see are pretty good at doing this mm -hmm. and i think i think that then goes then to you know and then we can open up for any questions that you may have um is you know we've talked about these types of communities that can kind of things in this type of you know really dynamic uh and supportive culture but we are living in an age in which a lot of our politics isn't so supportive like that Mm -hmm. um, and I know that there are serious debates, and I, I imagine one that you've thought about ethically, about how much is one willing and on what basis is one willing to work with different government regimes. So, I mean, I know, for instance, many people would find um, if the Trump administration, for instance, mm -hmm. has said, you know, we're really interested in some of the things. Would you, would you like to come and help that? A lot of people would say, well, no, I mean, because, you know, even if I like this particular aspect, the discourses in general that you're using are discriminatory and, you know, against a kind of inclusive ethics. Well, I think others have said, you know, you have to create spaces anywhere that you can. Mm -hmm. And you can't simply, you know, we're not at a place where we can easily pick and choose what opportunities we take or not, because, you know, like, you know, they said you have to create any opportunities you can. So, what are some of the ways in which we can, do you think we should begin mm -hmm. thinking about this as a kind of digital democratic, and I would say radical community? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, it reminds me of the, the old days of the Millennium Development Goals, uh, where yeah. the UN basically took a very deontological position and say, if you are a developed nation, no matter how much you don't like the developing nations, um, 
politics, military, infrastructure, human rights, uh, you, you still have to help uh, because it is kind of your burden as a developed nation yeah. uh, and that there's human suffering and there's really no ideological dispute that can prevent the critical help mm -hmm. that needs to put people out of poverty and, and things like that. Um, and of course that kind of worked, but I very much like the new narrative around the uh, uh, sustainable development goals, which I wear uh, <laughs> as a t-shirt uh, where, wherever I go. Uh, and, and the 17 uh, colors uh, for once doesn't make a distinction uh, purely based on developed versus developing or the people who can help versus people who needs help. But rather, it, it basically says, okay, we understand that there's um, 169 different important things. Uh, and we know this because we consulted more than 1 million people uh, around the world. And we understand that these are not um, commensurable, meaning that you can't really trade one thing for another. Uh, but we, we do understand that there's 17, roughly speaking, 17 communities uh, worldwide that would consider uh, one or two of these uh, different goals as more important than the others. So you just yeah. work on whatever you want to work on, basically. Regardless of whether you're developing or developed, uh, you can still identify through the sustainable goals one of the 17 tribes that you identify with. Uh, and then uh, the shape of the 169 uh, targets are shaped in the sense that it minimizes uh, trade-off and maximizes synergy, in the sense that if you work on any of those goals, you kind of automatically contribute to the other goals, even if you don't like their politics. Uh, and, yep. so, and so I think this kind of automatically synergistic accounting uh, in the sense of accountability, yeah, I think is is the most important thing that we can work um, in in the era of uh, post GDP uh, radical uh, narrative. Because we all yeah. agree that GDP is bankrupt uh, in terms of measuring uh, social progress or any kind of progress, really. Uh, but uh, okay. not many people agree on so what what what's next, right? Um, the, the well-being index is, is not fine-grained and flexible enough. The uh, happiness index maybe doesn't capture the different scale between communities and countries and, and things like that. And the sustainable goals only talk about goals. It doesn't talk about how to get there, right? So um, mm -hmm. it, the radical community, I think, it can really work well if we uh, seize the term of uh, measurement and management and accountability from the very mm -hmm. capitalistic interpretations and just starting mm -hmm. working on being accountable to each other, meaning that we, we can answer much easier than before, like what kind of impact one's, one's having, and without yeah. even agreeing on what, what kind of thing that uh, really requires doing, what kind of priority, because we kind of accept that 17 different tribes have different priorities anyway. Right. And, but yeah. if they keep each other accountable, then that's the spirit of SDG 17, is that if we have reliable data from all the different parties, it kind of automatically creates opportunities of synergy and uh, mm. opportunities of collaboration. And if you see that there's no synergy, well, you just don't. Right. So, so I, I think it is uh, the, the kind of overview effect of a mapping of the impact that we are creating and being accountable first to ourselves and then to the people we're collaborating with and not being afraid of working out loud in the sense of not being afraid of publishing all these things even in this raw and very uh, you know very easy to challenge form to the public internet I think it's the first step of building a solidarity that is based on um, evidence and impact and people's self-setting priorities rather than uh, imagined um, common utopians uh, thoughts because really people yeah. cannot really uh, agree on imagined utopia because we all have a, a lot of imaginative capabilities <laughs> and I'm sure that ours don't really overlap but it doesn't really matter yeah. because we're, we're not even there right so what what happens yes. is that what have I do, did do uh, what have I done in the past couple of months and am I happy enough to share it with anyone who asks and if I share it do we upload everything on YouTube and things like that and and gradually based on the trails, I think we can form opportunistic uh, synergies and collaborations without pre-agreeing on the doctrines and ideologies. Wow, no, I, and, I, and I think that's a very inspiring and powerful place. Um, and if I can say radically pragmatic place to end. Oh, yeah, very, very much so. <laughs> yeah. um, did you want to, I mean, those were the kind of main things that we were interested in. Um, was there anything that you wanted to kind of follow up on mm -hmm. or discuss? No, I, I think it's um, the 
the mobile democratic communities. I really like how you put it in air quotes uh, because it really means different things to to different yeah. people, right? Uh, it like during the conversation, I had the idea that uh, what you say mobile is kind of overlapping with with what I call recursive public in the sense that it mobilizes yeah. itself, right? So, so yeah. what, why do you choose the the term mobile in the first place? So I I think that's a really good question. We chose it, I think, for three particular reasons. One um, is because we did see mobile technologies, uh, as you say, kind of dominate some of these discussions. But in fact, they're quite partial in what they can achieve. So we were interested in why kind of mobile phones and mobile technologies were taking such a strong political um, mm -hmm. kind of organizing role and what they were kind of marginalizing as well. Mm -hmm. I think the second um, is their theoretical point about kind of going from mobile neoliberalism or mobile technologies in the sense of flexibilities and the recursive aspects, which we see within neoliberalism and which we see in dominant hegemonic ideologies, which is being flexible and adaptive enough mm -hmm, to local mm -hmm. conditions mm -hmm. and seeing how that's then being changed, actually. So how can you make revolutionary revolutions mobile? And I think the third was the ideas of resilient mobile communities. And we, I, one of the aspects that I found most problematic is that if you look at a lot of the discussions around community, it's still very, I would say, 20th century location based. Mm -hmm. But people are actually forming more mm -hmm. than just communications, mm -hmm. mobile digital communities. That's right. And what does that mean? How do we create ones that are resilient ones that have interesting cultures, ones that don't try to apply particular past paradigms onto them, but still that they can draw from. So we were interested in that in terms of then saying, what does this mean for quote unquote mobile organizing in quotes? Mm -hmm. And I think the book project we're working on, uh, which we should have out next year, is we saw this as a type of guerrilla democracy in terms of, you know, in this interesting way of being flexible, mobile, revolutionary, but also, in many ways, willing to establish its own systems, its own mm -hmm. cultures, its own mm -hmm. government mm -hmm. paradigm. I think in the broader sense, you, you really hit it perfectly, which is how do you create mobile safe spaces mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. to speak, that actually allow for people to make more sustained connections with each other that mm -hmm. are radical are about mm -hmm. possibilities as opposed to just resistance. That's right. So how, but, how, do, how do we make the safety move as you move, which is what mobile means anyway? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, I think that was a lot of what we were looking at. And one of the interesting points that, you know, it'd be worth following up on, you know, mm -hmm. as we progress um, is also this relationship between, I think, traditional types of social movement politics, which certainly takes us on. And some of the things you're talking about, which is a broader epistemological and ontological mm -hmm. shift, people from users, consumers, mm -hmm. to co-developers and co-creators. Mm -hmm. And that's a move that I think goes beyond just saying we're against austerity, for instance, or, you know, we're for this political party as opposed to that political party. And I do think that I found it interesting. We didn't get to talk about it in this conversation about this type of, you know, if we're being very literal, app culture. Mm. How this app culture, which I think started in many ways as something that was more co-creating, become more consumptive? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And what does that show about the dangers of some of this kind of mobile organizing and these types of things? And what we need to do to actually, you know, look beyond immediate political struggles to actually what kinds of radical cultures are we creating? Um, yeah, and I think mostly it's just uh, suddenly a lot of people can, for example, get on the World Web, but without the understanding that you can view source on all the web page. But pretty much yep. everybody on the early web knows that you can view source on the web page. So, so it is something I think that is um, just. You know, like the the Usenet and the uh, the uh, summer that never ends, or something like that. So yeah. uh, once you hit a critical um, kind of mass of uh, newcomers who brings a different culture, uh, it's a phase change for the original culture. And I think the the thing to do is not to kind of rediscover the the old culture because it's it's gone, right? But but rather to uh, identify what's important for the newcomers. And uh, for a lot of people uh, that I'm working with, especially school children because we're now teaching media literacy 
AI and whatever in K to 12 now, uh, what, what we found is that what they are looking at is to make meaningful interpersonal connections. And if they uh, want, uh, for example, a Arduino or a Raspberry Pi uh, project to, to make uh, useful interpersonal connections, like uh, showing their families how many steps they're from the home <laughs> so that they can predict where they go home and things like that, um, it, it suddenly uh, there's much more um, motivation to look into to look under the hood and to view source on even the apps uh, mm -hmm. or on even uh, you know any technologies that's between them and the kind of interpersonal relationship that they're they're, they're uh, keen to do but otherwise yeah I would agree that it's now much easier to just browse through the scratch projects without modifying uh, any of those mm -hmm. scratch projects and from people in kindergarten and so on but mm -hmm. certainly I don't think it's a bad thing I, I think it's just a phase right if you uh, immerse yourself in the uh, Wikipedia community for a couple of years without editing one single article, uh, that, that still prepares you better, right? <laughs> to, yeah, to become absolutely. an eventual editor. So, so I think to have a community that lasts longer than a average uh, lifetime of engagement, I think that's the important thing, which is why sustainability is the keyword of mm -hmm. the SDGs. Yeah. And, and I think that also touches on another of the mobile aspects that mm -hmm. we were really interested in, and it'd be good to also follow mm -hmm. up some of this conversation, but mm -hmm. also, you know, there's so many aspects of the work that you're doing and others are doing, which is, you know, 20 years ago, you probably remember these conversations, people forget this, but one of the main arguments against some of the smart technology and mobile technology is that, well, we can do it and, you know, we can make the processors, we can do it, but how are people going to learn to use it? I mean, you know, it just takes too much effort. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it was a real argument that people had. That's right. And what you saw was that actually, if you make it into something usable mm -hmm. and fun, mm -hmm. people, you know, for both good and bad will learn to use it. That's right. Yet, I don't think in many ways we teach some of our more radical civic education in a traditional way, like let's have people in classrooms and just mm -hmm. do it. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, what? I mean, I would not necessarily want us to learn from, you know, Apple in terms of their ethics. But mm -hmm. I would ask, as I say, what can we learn about actual, you know, from capitalism that they've actually had this kind mm -hmm. of pervasive life learning of they're actually mm -hmm. asking people to do huge amounts of learning mm -hmm. in short amount of time. Mm -hmm. And they've been successful at it. So what can we learn from a different ethical framework from that? Right. I, I would like to, to uh, kind of conclude with a real example, which is a real civics class in a senior high school, the first grade of senior high. Uh, and uh, that's, I think, the 10th grade. Uh, and uh, the teacher just told the students to go to the e-petition platform in Taiwan, join the gov.tw, and find whatever cause that you think that can mobilize more than 500 people, and therefore demanding the ministries to give you a, a reasonable response. Response. And wow. uh, so um, a, a young girl uh, just uh, found this, I think, photo of a turtle being choked on a plastic straw or something like that. Uh, and so she mobilized uh, to advocate to take out uh, plastic straws everywhere and certainly uh, in, you know, indoor uh, drinking, uh, which is yeah. kind of controversial because in Taiwan, you know, bubble tea is national identity drink uh, and, and the straw <laughs> always goes with it, right? <laughs> and so, so but, but she, yeah, but she's, she's really good at, at mobilizing that message. And, and lo and behold, there's more than 5,000 people uh, petitioning wow. uh, together. And so I, as the minister in charge of open government, have to uh, do a collaborative workshop. And we met with the petitioner, and they're all young people. <laughs> and it, it, it's, it's very heartening <laughs> to, to see that they, yeah. they, they were able to mobilize so well on the internet, much better than I would have done uh, were I that age, right? And, and so what, what I think is most important is that to let the young people uh, be part of the civics. It, it's not just uh, the teacher teaching them how to be effective. It's rather the teacher learning from them how to be effective because it's a really open-ended question out there. Yeah. And, and by the way, starting this year, because of that e-petition, uh, indoor you know, straw, plastic straw is banned. So, so they really wow. effected uh, a, a social change. Uh, and I think that's one of the best ways to teach civics. Absolutely. That's fantastic. And, I, and like I said, I think that's a really inspiring place again to end. Um, Thank you so much. I mean, this was uh, fantastic and I think really eye-opening um, as I expected. Um, and some of these things hopefully we can follow up further with. Um, mm -hmm.
But thank you again. And mm -hmm. I think that people will be interested in this. And certainly this is going to help with our research. OK, so I'm going to publish this right away and send you the link. And it will be under a Creative Commons attribution license. <laughs> <All right. laughs> That's Cheers. Okay. Right, thank you so much. Bye. Bye.